Bat fans, today we're going to be looking at the ArcGIS Python API in Jupyter Notebooks. Jupyter? Jupyter? Not sure how that should be pronounced. I've put a zero one at the end of this because I think it's a good candidate for a series of videos and if you'd like to see more of them, please hit the thumbs up, do subscribe to the channel and please share this video. That's a real easy way to show that you are enjoying this topic. And away we go. If you do not have any Esri software installed or Jupyter Notebooks or Jupyter Notebooks installed, then don't worry about it. If you go to this web address, notebooks.esri.com, I'm just going to enter that. This will take you to the ArcGIS Notebook server. Um, here, this is what a Jupyter Notebook normally looks like on your machine. Uh, but this is Esri's that they provide. So you can start um, You can start a new notebook, you can do whatever you'd like to do. There's a guide, there's some labs, some samples, all that kind of stuff. Good fun. So you don't need any Esri software for this. If you would like to install the trial version, then please see one of my previous videos. And that will give you a certain number of days to toy around with the software. But if you'd rather not, then you can just use this. Don't think it's possible to save your work from this because it's running on the cloud and it will get wiped as soon as you leave. But this is a place to go if you would just like to try out the code that we are going to run during this video. If you do have ArcGIS software installed, here I'm in ArcGIS Pro. And I just want to show you down at the bottom, if you go to settings, in our list of settings, over on the left hand side, you can go to the Python settings. This will refresh our package information to begin with, and you can do the management of all your Python environments, etc., through ArcGIS Pro in this section. Um, so here I've got a project environment, that's just the default and it tells you where it is stored on your machine, it shows you all your installed packages, all that jazz. So that's good, note this, uh, I cannot modify the default Python environment, clone and activate a new environment. So if you're making substantial changes to the Python environment, you will need a clone of it. Don't worry too much about that. We're not going to get involved with anything like that in this vid. We're just going to do a very simple Jupyter Notebook. So from here, the easiest way to start that Jupyter Notebook is to bring up your Windows menu, hitting your Windows key, and just start typing Python. And we'll get a number of different things. Python Interactive Terminal, Python Command Prompt. And if I go to the Command Prompt and open the file location, here you can see that I've got a Python Command Prompt that is installed in the same place as my ArcGIS Pro. And if I start that, here we have that default environment started up and this is where it resides. And from there, to kick off our Jupyter Notebook, I can just type in Jupyter Notebook, hit enter, and things will begin. And here is our Jupyter Notebook. Excellent. With the Jupyter Notebook running, I have created some uh, extra folders, and here we've got one called Arc API. So I'm just going to click into that. And I've got a workbook here called Map Widget. I'm actually going to start a new workbook and I'll just go up to new and go to Python 3. And here's our new workbook. Excellent. Now I don't want it to be called untitled. I will call it Map Widget Demo. And let's rename that. And if you're not familiar with Jupyter Notebook, um, it is a very cool resource in which we can test Python code. So it's a nice way to test out ideas and just run things and see what happens. Now you might be wondering why I launched Jupyter Notebook using the ArcGIS environment. That gives us access to this thing called the GIS module. And from this, you can see from this diagram that we get access to lots of GIS, ArcGIS related things. So the first thing that we're going to do in this Jupyter Notebook is actually import this GIS module and create our GIS. 
Thanks for your patience so far. I promise we're moving on to more fun stuff now. And so we're back in Jupiter and in this notebook, in this particular cell, I'm going to start off by an import statement. So I'm going to say from the Arc GIS package and the GIS module specifically, I'm going to import a class called GIS. Using that GIS, I'm going to assign it to a new variable called myGIS. So that class is now equal to that. And I'm going to start another variable called myMap. And that is going to be equal to myGIS.map. Now let's just try running this and make sure that everything is working. Yes, that looks like it's absolutely fine. So let's have a look at what we've done. We've imported the GIS class, we've assigned it to the variable myGIS, and then we've started another variable, myMap, and we have taken the map method from the myGIS class and assigned it to myMap. Great, now let's put in myMap and run this again. And this is where we should see some magic happen. This is what's known as the map widget. So we've got this working now in our Jupyter Notebook. And notice that we've got this very clever little doohickey up here. And if we click on that, we can get into a 3D scene. You can do all your zooming, panning, whatever you'd like to do as per usual. So this map widget is a nice way to test out different things that you might be doing with the ArcGIS Python API. Now this map method can actually take some arguments. So here I'm going to add in the Amazon Basin. And this will act as a kind of crude search function. So if we run this again, there we can see we're focused in on the Amazon Basin. So you could try putting anything in there. You could put postcodes in there, whatever you'd like. Currently, we look like we are zoomed out a little bit far. I'm just going to add a zoom level of four. And let's run that again. Hmm, didn't change that much. Let's try a zoom level of 10. This should bring us in super close. And it does. So I'm going to go back to four, actually. I prefer that one. But you can see that the map method takes some arguments. There are other arguments that we could add, but I'll let you go to the docs and work those out for yourself. Now the current map uh, base map is the looks like topographic with some labels as well, which is okay, but you might have noticed from most of my screens that I prefer dark mode. So I'm gonna add a base map and I'm gonna say my map, base map, and then equals the dark gray vector. Now there is a bunch of base maps available from Esri and again you can find these in the docs. I'll show you a link to the docs at the end of the video and how they work. But if we go my map dot base map equals dark gray vector and then we run this. You can see that we now have a dark gray base map. Excellent. So this looks a little more modern, a little bit cooler. And what should we add next? We could have a look for some data. No, this is not the end of the video, but I decided to show you the docs a little bit earlier. So if you have a look at Esri's website in the ArcGIS for developers, you can find the ArcGIS API for Python. And we're gonna be looking for some data next. So we're gonna be using the search function and the docs are pretty good for ArcGIS API for Python, so that's great news. And what we're going to be doing is using the uh, search function. So our gis.content.search is what we want to be using, and this is how it looks. So we can see that looks all good, and I've spent quite a bit of time in the docs to put this little example together for you. Now, when we're searching for content, it will be looking at the living atlas. So Esri's living atlas, all the data that's available there. 
And notice that I'm not signed in here. This is just stuff that is freely available. So let's have a look for modus. And I'm going to look for fire. Uh, yeah, these suggestions look good. Satellite modus, thermal hotspots, and fire activity. So if we search for that, Living Atlas will bring this up. And I'm just in my browser here having a look. And here we can see the modus, thermal hotspots, and fire activity. Now, if I click on this, that is going to take us into ArcGIS.com. Again, I'm not signed in yet. These data are freely available. And we get a description as to what this data layer is all about. Uh, so it's detectable thermal activity from modus satellites for the last 48 hours. It comes from NASA etc etc and here we have a url to it as well and if we go up into the url at the top you can see that it has this id here and it's just a string of alphanumeric nonsense but that id becomes quite important and i'll show you why when we get back into our jupyter notebook so what i'd like to do from the notebook is search for these particular data in order to perform our search, I'm going to start a new cell. So I'm just going to say escape, hit escape, and then press B. And that will create a new cell below for us. And I'm going to start a new variable called fire search. And that's going to be equal to mygis.content.search. And in this search, let's begin by searching for fire. Now, if I run this, we have no app output all that's doing is searching for fire but we've not actually asked python to output anything so i'm just going to put fire search at the bottom and that will print whatever's in here let's have a look oh we've got all sorts item title we've got sentinel 2 views world imagery firefly all sorts of different things and you can see that we've also got this type map image layer web mapping application, all different kinds of types. Now, if I remember correctly, this had modus in it. So let's put modus in there as well. And can we see that? Thermal hotspots and fire activity. That's a web map. I'd actually like the type to be a feature layer. Let's see if that hones it in anymore. And our title is going to have these words in it. Modus, thermal hotspots from fire activity. This is a feature layer collection. It's owned by Esri and it's a live feed. This looks very good. Now, if we wanted to print just one of these items, we'd refer to it by number. And don't forget that in a list in Python, we start with the number zero. So if I want to print the first one, I could put square brackets around it and put in a zero. And if we do that, here it is. Notice that it changes as well. So instead of just printing the raw list, it's, raw list, it's actually printing the item itself. And if I were to click on this, it would take us back to ArcGIS Online. So that's pretty nice. And this does actually have properties as well. So if I put a dot in there, I think we should be able to put that in and just ask for the ID. And there it is. Remember that alphanumeric nonsense that we had previously? That is the ID that we can use to refer to that particular layer. Now that we have the ID, we can actually get this layer. So I'm going to make a new variable called fire layer once I sort my typing out. And that is going to be equal to mygis.content.get. So I'm going to use this get function and I'm going to get the ID I'm going to get by ID of the first item in my fire search. So let's run this. Marvelous. And then let's output the fire layer and see what happens. And there's that fire layer. 
So now we have the layer that we have retrieved using the ID. And that gives us a variable with that layer in it. So if I were to take my map and I was to add Oops, add a layer and make that the fire layer and then to recreate my map widget let's have a look what happens here's my map again and look what appears this is the modus fire data for the last 48 hours. Now, obviously fires have been big in the news at the moment and so this is partly a way to show you how you can access these data and investigate for yourself what's happening across the world in terms of fire. Now I'm not particularly keen on the way that these symbols are drawn and if we click on these this map widget is pretty comprehensive. If I click on this it will actually bring up all the information, all the attributes of that point. So very, very cool. We've got brightness reading, the object ID, uh, what scan it's from, what track it's on, which satellite sensor it comes from, the confidence limit. So this could be good. That's 100% confident that this is a particular fire. We've got the brightness and then we have got the output in megawatts and this particular one is 304 megawatts so it looks like the interesting attributes here could be the confidence level and the megawatt output i'd need to check the dots to find out what frp exactly stands for and it's a good idea when using any data to always make sure you know exactly what all the attributes are so perhaps we could do that. Now here I've just jumped back to the living atlas and having a look at this modus thermal hotspots and fire activity data description. And you can see here in the source, we have NASA firms active fire data for world. So if I click on this link, that will take us to that. And the link brings us here, firms, fire information for resource management system. Now note at the top, due to heavy usage, please consider using Firms 2. Likely this is because of the media storm around the Amazonian fires. Um, so lots of people are accessing this data at the moment. Uh, we do have old data in the archive and we've got all sorts of different data files that we can download. But nowhere on this page at the moment can I see anything about the metadata. But if we go down to the resources, uh, we've got the MODIS Active Fire User Guide. That is probably going to be the most useful. So if I just have a look at this, and there we go, we've got the Active Fire Product Users Guide. And again, what I'm trying to do here is just find out what all these things mean. So with this PDF open in my browser, if I just go for a control F to search, I can see maximum FLP is going to be on page 24, section 2.23. So let's go to page 24. And let's have a look, see if we can find it. Where's the FLP? Maximum fire radiative power all five pixels falling within each grid cell is provided on a daily basis of the max FRP. So FRP stands for fire radiative power. Uh, it might also be useful to have a look at how that confidence limit is calculated as well. So really here I'm just showing you that it's really important if you're using any data to double check and make sure you know what you're looking at. Now what I'd like to do next is to have a look at these data and start looking at how we could visualize it differently in our map widget. So that could be a potential next video. If you're interested in seeing that video, again, please don't forget to like, don't forget to subscribe, and please share this video as well. Uh, that will let me know that 
you guys are interested in this and I will have a look at how we could thin this data out. My idea so far of putting some kind of filter on it or maybe using opacity so that we don't show the least confident fires. Looks like it has some of that built in already. I expect this to be less confident. Yeah, that's only 59%. So I might put a filter on and just cut those out um, and then we could have a look at some different styling as well. Uh, it does look a bit overwhelming when you zoom out and it looks like the whole tropics are on fire. But thank you for watching. Um, I hope you found this video useful and don't forget, happy mathing.